Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media channel focused on all things 90s and 2000s. This week, Seb and Ollie will be discussing... Bicentennial Man! Welcome to Film de Siècle, a channel devoted to analysing and discussing media from 1990 to 2010, the turn of a century. My name's Seb, and I'm here with my partner. I'm, I'm Ollie Johnson. I have a master's in performance practices and a degree in performing arts, which I attained after dropping out of the University of Life. And I have absolutely no qualifications to be doing this whatsoever. I just watch movies sometimes. Oh, no, do I really. It's just on paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like how your um, empire of deceit has fallen apart already. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yes, we're here today to discuss the biggest, the most anticipated science fantasy movie of 1999, Bicentennial Man, starring legendary actor Robin Williams. Yeah, and um, this probably would have been right before or around the time he released Let Me Entertain You. Um, yes, yes, uh, you know, it's a shame he left to take that, but I think he had a better solo career, you know, friend like me, you know, all the hits. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're getting our Robins and our Robbies mixed up. Bison Is anyone outside of the UK going to get that? I don't know. Do people like him in America? I mean, he has a house in America, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm was he big there? not sure. I don't know. Is he a purely British thing? or I, I, I think he's liked in Russia and like Europe, but I, I, don't, I don't know about America. <laughs> if you're American, tell us if you like Robbie Williams. Bicentennial Man was based on the 1992 novel The Positronic Man by Isaac Asimov, the legendary science fiction writer, who um, whose work inspired iRobot, amongst the uh, uh, works of film. Uh, and the Positronic and Man... It's also the Binding of Isaac, I assume, on the title alone and not guess. I don't know. That, that's a video game, isn't it? Yeah, I, I've never... I, I know nothing. I know nothing. It sounds religious, but I don't want to assume. It probably is religious. <laughs> it's like, that Isaac is a much more apt parable to a title in a game than Isaac Asimov. Yeah. probably be called Asimov. But yes, um, it was based on his 1976 novelette, The Bicentennial Man, which is what the movie took its name from. Now, reading the synopsis, the plot explores issues of humanity, slavery, prejudice... Maturity, intellectual freedom, conformity, sex, love, mortality, and eternal life. Although it's also self-described as a comedy drama, so, you know. Um, What's the opposite of transhumanism? Uh, transrobotism? I think it's just humanism. Humanism, I suppose. <laughs> yes, but that, that, that's the theme of the movie. Uh, it's, a very, it's full of very heavy themes... But we watched the trailer the other day, didn't we, Ollie? Yeah. How would you um, describe that trailer? Totally all over the place, a bit like us for these last couple of minutes. I know, Uh, I mean... It's probably why we like the movie, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one minute they were playing, like, hot chocolate, you know, I believe in miracles, and then the next they're saying, an epic journey through time. Yeah, and then they, they show the scene where the girl has him jump out of the window, and Basically, they show all the light-hearted, funny comedy scenes where Robbie Williams is being... Robbie, oh my god, you got me doing it. Robin Williams is telling <laughs> like, <laughs> he's telling loads of jokes and just being plain, you know, Robin Williams, like, like he usually is, just doing a bit of uh, lame stand-up as a robot. Uh, and then it switches gears up to, you know, I want to be human. You know, I just want to be acknowledged. And it's just all over the place. Yeah. I mean, the I warning guess- signs were in the trailer, but... I think people went into this expecting to see a, uh, you know, comedy. And I think they walked out a bit empty when they realised it really wasn't. Well, it's not not a comedy. It has but, funny moments. It made me laugh. Yeah. But, I mean, I hadn't watched it in full until a couple of years ago when uh, you wrote that list with me of films that I really should have seen by yes. now. Yes. <laughs> And the sad thing is, I don't think this movie's on anyone's list. It's just gone below everyone's radar since 1999. Well, it wasn't massively well-received by critics. 
No, but I think it's more of an obscurity thing than it's it's reviled. Because whenever I talk to someone, said, "Oh my god, have you ever seen Bicentennial Man?" Like ninety nine percent of people say, "What's that?" You know, no, no, no one remembers it. Yeah, true. I mean, I had seen bits of it before. I think uh, my family rented it once on video, dating myself a uh, bit there. Yeah, so it's, it's basically one of those movies where you'd see bits of it if it was on the TV, and that would be it. Yeah. Um, but the the trailer, just um, standing on its own, was all over the place. I like, know! What are you? There are really good films that are totally all over the place, but uh, the trailer didn't really... Give me an idea of what I was in for. Yeah, I mean... Other than the most literal sense. I think we would both see it out of curiosity if it came out today, judging by the trailer, but it's not one of those where we'd go, oh my god, I can't wait for the new Robin Williams movie. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so how we're going to do this is we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, our impressions of the movie, having either seen it or not seen it before. Uh, followed by us going away to watch the movie again and then giving a full depth analysis and discussion of the movie, you know, having seen it freshly. So, yeah. Ollie, you saw it once and that was with me a few years ago? Yeah. Yeah, uh, what, what do you think of it, thinking back, you know, not having seen it in a long time? Well, from what I remember, it was quite long, <laughs> um, which, you know... It's the theme. He lives a long time. How long was it? I'm, I'm going to have a look. Uh... Well, given that the title is Bicentennial Man, I'm going to say about 200 years. No, no, no. I don't mean... <laughs> Two hours, 12. Did you, feel... oh, right. Did you think it was longer? I don't mean this in a bad way, but it felt longer. It did, didn't it? I think it's because it takes place over such a huge amount of time. It feels like a long movie. You know, it's it's just one of those. It was as long as Attack of the Clones, and uh, funny enough, it was longer than iRobot, but I would say it was twice as long as iRobot, you know, putting the two side to side. Well, the pacing is quite slow. Yeah. Uh, it takes it t- which, its time, and I like that in a movie. I mean, I say it feels longer than it is, but that I don't want people to take that as me saying I thought it was boring. Yeah. Because I didn't. Uh I mean, the times I've seen it, it's always grabbed my attention. I remember seeing it when it first, around 2003, when it had its first TV debut. Uh, I, it completely passed me by in the cinema. Um, but when I saw it on the TV, I was mind blown. And uh, I watched it a few times. Uh, the last time I saw it was a few months ago when I had just turned on the TV and it was on. It's weird because the pacing is really slow and really fast at the same time. Like, the passage of time runs completely counter to the pacing of the story, if that makes sense. Yeah, because say, you know, like 80 years in, it spends about half an hour with him, and then, you know, it's like 50 years later, and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, that's a lot of time to skip. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I remember liking this movie. So I think it's about time we both put it on and uh, came back, uh, reconvene, and see what we think now. Yeah, all right, let's get to it. Oh, well, okay, we've just come back. We've watched Bicentennial Man again. Um, First question on the list, we've got six questions. Did you like it? Yes, I did. Me too. (laughs) On to the next one. Glad we got got that out of the way. (laughs) Yeah, on to question two. No, 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 let's elaborate. What did you like about it? Well, um... I had a cheeky look at Rotten Tomatoes in the time before when we watched it, and now it's 36% with critics. I was curious. It's gone up. No, I, I'm... Oh, with on. critics, yeah. Yeah, it was higher with, with critics. critics. Yeah. Thir- no, 36% with critics, I'm fairly sure. Um, well, it was in the 30s. Yeah. And... Yeah... I don't know why that is. I've seen far worse films with higher ratings. Me too. I um, don't know what they've got against it. Yeah. Well, I suppose you might call it cheesy. I mean, th- there are things this film could teach about cheese to a quattro for Maggio pizza. True, true. Yeah. But I like cheese, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a very deep movie, and it's quite a heavy movie at times. 
I think it's more a uh, much more relevant now than it was back then, but I'll come back to that in Category 5. Uh, I really liked it. I think it felt very much of its time, like it's the kind of really good deep movie we were getting in the mid-late 90s. I connected with the characters. It, uh, it just felt very human, and I know that's kind of the rise on data of the main character to feel human, but you know, every, you could understand why he, he, what his motivations were the whole way through, how his motivations changed, yeah. how uh, how he perceived himself evolved. Uh, Andrew, the main character, who was also a robot slash android. Yeah, um, I guess uh, one of the central messages of the film would be: time is terrifying. I'll agree. I mean, every time yeah. they skip time, you felt that. I mean, everyone yeah. looked considerably older. It's incredible how they made aged up people like Sam Neill, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Portia. Uh, just, uh, yeah, it's amazing how they did that. Uh, and ro- even Robin Williams. Uh, in fact, to be yeah. honest, it was really emotional at the end, out of context, because, you know, sadly, we, we never got to see Robin Williams looking that old. You know, we never got to see him at that age. Yes, uh, sadly, Robin Williams is no longer with us, which makes that ending all the more uh, keenly felt. Yeah, it's like, before the ending was emotional, but, you know, watching it since, it's quite hard to sit through, to be honest. Didn't we originally watch it shortly after Robin Williams died? Yeah, and I think we both agreed it was the worst possible time we could have watched it. Yeah, yeah. Well... I can see people being turned off by the film's excessive cheesiness and sentimentality. It's a bit saccharine, maybe, but I didn't mind that. No, uh, it ran every gambit, you know. It, uh, it was every kind of movie rolled into one, and thematically, it felt like a homunculus. Not unlike the main yeah. character, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> I see you reaching there. But yeah, yeah. seriously, I am... Um, <laughs> I think that was sort of what turned people off about it, maybe. It didn't quite seem to figure out what it wanted to be uh, um, for some of the runtime. Uh, a lot of the more powerful emotional scenes were often undercut with a joke. Yeah, I mean, on their own, the scenes stand up extremely well, but you'd have one scene where, you know, a character would be making a profound monologue about what it is to be human, and then the next you'd have a joke about Robin Williams assaulting uh, the other robot with a drill. And then next you'd have a romantic scene between Robin Williams and the uh, great-granddaughter of his former owner. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. That's, um... I don't think it... uh, No, I was just going to say, it kind of reminded me of another movie, which I think did this considerably worse, because it was even more mixed in its tone. Uh, And that movie's Click, you know, the Adam Sandler movie, because it was advertised as a comedy, it was set up as a comedy, uh, and then it ended up being quite a serious movie, quite a sombre one, you know, at times. It was quite an emotional movie, and that's not what it was billed as. And I don't think it's quite fair to compare Bicentennial Man to Click. I don't know, there's a lot of parallels. You know, you've got the sort of exaggerated future, although it's played more for laughs in Click. You know, you've... I think it is interesting that um, both films play with time and both feel very tonally all over the place. Yeah, I think that Bicentennial Man does it much better because it knows when to be funny and when not to, except for when it doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, and Generally that's not. that's the thing about this film. It does it's really good, except for when it isn't. I mean, it spends the first half an hour of a movie saying, "All right, we know it's Robin Williams. He's going to do some stand-up for you, and then the rest of the movie is going to be serious." Okay, guys. Because <laughs> there is that yeah. scene where you know he's learning how to tell jokes. You know, um, Andrew, uh, because he wants to. And he tells several different jokes, uh, and he just does them in quick succession with no context, like he does like dirty jokes in front of kids. Yeah, he doesn't pause for laughs at any point. No, <laughs> which somehow makes it even funnier. You know, only Robin Williams yeah. can achieve that. 
yeah. he somehow nailed the delivery while being a monotone machine and it was perfect oh I just like this movie I don't understand how it can not be somebody's cup of tea to the extent where they complain about it yeah I mean I can understand somebody not clicking with it but I can't understand anybody being offended by it to the point of giving it a bad review on the internet well I didn't um, look at the audience reception but I can understand a professional critic giving this a bad review it's um, you might accuse it of being emotionally manipulative yeah or um, I don't know if manipulative is the right word Um, you could accuse it of not earning the emotions it expects you to feel occasionally but I think there is some genuine capacity in there for making you feel something. I mean, do elaborate, because I sort of think I know where you're coming from, because of all the time skips, a lot of things develop quickly. Like, the romance plot sort of develops quite quickly, and that probably could have done with being five to ten minutes longer. Yeah. We are asked to assume an awful lot uh, about those time skips. I mean, we're not all... We're not even told sometimes how much time has passed. And that's a minor detail. It's not important. But um... And the only reason why like the um, uh, later character, Portia, I think is the name of the later one, uh, played by... Oh, what's her name? I just watched the bloody movie. <laughs> what's wrong with me? Uh... But yeah, I think that um, it was never clear what she found so attractive about Andrew. It was more that you know he made her laugh and that was it. I mean, well, um, movies would have you believe that's enough. I know that that's a very <laughs> in Buff Davids. That's it. I didn't want to get it wrong because I, 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 she was also very good I, in the television show Californication, where she was in there for a season, um, uh, playing alongside David Duchovny, who's another very good actor who we don't see enough of. Right. Um, Sorry, I've gone on right, a what, tangent there. I mean, what was I saying? I can't remember now. I don't know. It was probably a lot better than what I said. Yeah, but I can't remember what it is now. Wonderful. Um, what was I talking about? I was. Well, we were talking about. Did you like the movie? You were saying no, but no, what was you... I saying I specifically? You were saying. you were saying you felt like some of the emotional high points of the movie weren't sufficiently earned. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, back on to yeah, the back on track. train of thought Sorry. that I was on. Uh, see, it asks you to, well invest emotionally in these characters but it only gives you a lot of it only really gives you time with one of them to the point where you could um expect that level of investment and well the others are a well they feel a bit like extras in their own story i mean maybe (laughs) Um, it's because it's the same actress but it kind of felt like a lot of the emotional development between you know, um, Ember Davids and uh, Robin Williams' characters, uh, you know, developed over the course of Little Miss and then carried over to the granddaughter character, which, you know, it, yeah, it doesn't really uh, make sense. I suppose it's a bit like movie making cheating in a way, isn't it? Yeah, I mean. Sort of like, oh, it's, it's her uh, granddaughter. But also, the fact that he sought her out for familial attachment. Yeah. Because she was technically part of the family that uh, he was born into, for lack of a better term. And it's implied that there was some sort of unspoken thing between <laughs> the robot and, um, you know, uh, Little, Little Miss. Miss. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a little bit... Uh, but I think he gets a robot pass. Yeah, he gets a robot pass, <laughs> and not biologically related pass. It's the R word pass. But yeah... um, how well, this is question number two, by the way, how well did the film accomplish its goals and what were the goals from what we can gather? Well, I think first we'd better answer part two of that question, what were those goals? And, well, it is a Robin Williams movie. Yeah. Uh, it bears a lot of the hallmarks of the man himself. Yeah. <laughs> Such as... Musical numbers. Musical numbers. Was there a musical number? No, he never sung in the movie. No. <laughs> uh, why don't I know that? I I just watched it. <laughs> like, um, I I I kind of like how Andrew is pitched as having 
so many abilities, some of which he only uses once. Like, um, he has a projector built into his head. He used that uh, twice, to be fair. Did he? When was the uh, second time? He used it at the very beginning to do that weird presentation, which was a, oh, yeah. another one of those tonally the- weird moments where he does the three laws of robotics, which, you know, is a hallmark of Isaac Asimov's writing. But it was weird yeah. that it was there because it never comes up again, you know, the three laws. So it's weird that yeah. it got an establishing scene it- and that it was so tonally different from even the funny scenes in this movie. Yeah, I mean, it was more kind of lip service to the idea, I suppose. Because I'm not even sure, by the end, the robots are adhering by... Actually, that's a good philosophical question, because at the very end, and yeah, spoiler alert if you haven't seen this movie, I should hope that you'd have seen it by now if you're looking into a deep dive of this film. But at the very end, Galatea, who's the other robot character who's sort of watching Andrew through most of the movie, uh, you know, does at least make part of the way towards the transition to being human herself. And at the very end, Ember David's um, second character orders, you know, her to turn off, um, you know, assumably her life support. And she says one is glad to be of service and does it, which seems to be against the laws of robotics. And that's either, you know, is she no longer subject to those rules or because she considers herself human, does she no longer hold herself to those rules? You know, that's sort of an interesting philosophical debate. Yeah. Um, there's also, obviously, the um, age-old sci-fi trope of what makes a human. Yes, and I love that this movie does that so well. Yeah. And if that's one um, of the things it's looking to accomplish, it did that perfectly, in my view. Yeah, well, within the first few minutes, y- you get the sense that he's... Not quite like a robot. Yeah, because there's the scene where he finds the spider in the basement and lets it go free, which, you know, wouldn't be a necessary part of a household robot's programming. No, I suppose not. I mean, it could be part of his programming to not harm humans extends to other living creatures, but uh, I I doubt it would extend to insects. No, and it it didn't in iRobot. It didn't in iRobot, which is part... Not part of the cinematic universe, but of course... You know, writings from the same author. The Bicentennial Man Cinematic Universe. Yes. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, One thing I love about the beginning of this movie is the opening credits where you see Andrew being conceived, you know, built. I think this is the first movie where the opening credits are the main character being conceived. Yeah. And we don't really get opening credits like that anymore, the only where other one? something tangentially related to the story is happening over it. The only other ones I know of are the two Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movies. Yeah, with the um, machine making candy yeah. as the credits for. I guess um, Sweeney Todd is comparable, but it's not the same. No. I mean, that's more of a thematic illustrations happening over the opening credits. Yeah, whereas this is sort of base value, this is the factory and how it works. I mean, it sort of feels like a Chris Columbus movie because his movies are very sentimental. I mean, that's sort of why I think the first two Harry Potter movies have so much charm. You know, the the other movies are sort of more epic, sort of, um, you know, like um, young adult action movies, whereas the first two were very heartwarming and sentimental. Yeah, yeah. Um, The soundtrack felt um, a little bit... Dated? Well, um, of its time, perhaps. I wouldn't say dated. I mean, I got some Home Alone vibes through the soundtrack. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, it's mid- It's definitely not John Williams, because it just doesn't feel like John Williams, but it makes you feel what it wants you to feel. Yeah, there. it's... It does that well. There is definite emotional clarity. Yes, and that, that's another good thing about this movie. It never feels that murky emotionally. No, no. Um, you know, there's nuances, but, you know, we sort of understand where every character's coming from. I guess, like, I talked about it going through the... The pacing is really weird. Yes. Because the film is just over two hours long, and two hours and change. Uh, well, this is a man's it, life. 
a very long life. Yeah. Uh, but we see very little of it. Like, we see the cliff notes, essentially, of his life. Yeah. The important bits. And occasionally, like, a bit to flesh it out. It's like, we see the part where he first gains the ability to feel pain or the, the, yeah. a sense of taste. And, um, yeah. I think it shows us just enough of Andrew to earn the sadness when, well, when the end comes. Well, yeah, I agree. But... Because part of the sadness comes from real world events revolving around. Robin Williams, you know, the circumstances behind his death. Um, uh, but also, I think on its own, it stands up well. Yeah, I uh, I agree. Um, I do think it could have done with being a bit longer, but yes. also, it. I don't know if more runtime would help the film. I would be very like, curious to watch the deleted scenes of this movie. Yeah, well... It's weird for me because it already feels long to me. Like for the first hour, I don't feel the runtime, but around the point where he, um, where Little Miss dies. Yes. Spoiler alert. <laughs> well, we we're going to assume that you've seen these movies. Yeah. Like that that should be a disclaimer we put up at the beginning of everything. We we're going to assume that you've seen the movie we're talking about. That will go in the channel description. That will go in yeah. the channel description. Oh, I would also put a disclaimer up in front of each video just in case people stumble upon it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. Anyway. Around the part where Little Miss dies, that's when I start to feel the runtime, mm. and uh, well, I won't say I get a bit bored, but it's it gets a little bit harder to focus because I'm very easily distracted. Yeah, uh, you know, you don't have the sort of Robin Williams jokes to keep you coming back. Well, you do, but they feel increasingly out of place. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I I know what you mean. Um. Because the tone is... The natural progression of this story demands a more... Not serious or sombre, but... Mature? A more straight-faced tone. Yeah, a more mature tone would be quite a, quite appropriate. And, well, we know that Robin Williams can pull it off. In fact, I think he's the perfect person to pull it off. He's just one of those known-as-comic actors who can perform a serious role extremely well. Yeah. Uh... To be honest, I would have loved to see more of the world of that film, because we just don't. We get bits and pieces along the way, and we can sort of piece it together. Like They're sort of talking about, you know, this is like 70 years later, when he's first deciding to present as human properly, and he visits um, the uh, Earl Burns character to, you know, get his prosthetics. Uh, you know, it's sort of established then that um, futurism and androids are sort of seen as out of fashion at this point. And interestingly, earlier on you see stuff like flying cars, and for a while you don't. And then later on you see flying cars again. You know. Uh... And also it does that weird trope of having, sort of assuming that a one world government will happen. Which is quite ironic yeah. since there's probably more countries now than there were at the time this movie was made. I mean, I was just looking in the background when they're doing the World Congress scene to see if I could find Yugoslavia or, you know, Sudan, you know, before it spits into North and South, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sort of falls into a lot of the old sci-fi tropes where it assumes things like that in 2005 we'll have robots. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had Furbies in 2005. <laughs> that was about <laughs> it. Yeah. We had iPods, <laughs> but, you know, we didn't quite get to the robot stage yet. And spoiler yeah. alert, 2020, still no robots. Yeah, the aesthetic is very grounded, except when it isn't. Like, there's some establishing shots of flying cars, hover cars, and, like, in particular towards the end, outside the, um, what's it called? The, the, the... We'll just call it the Senate building from um, Coruscant, because that's basically what it is. Right. The Senate building from Coruscant. <laughs> like, and you've got, like, news vans landing on the pavement and there's hover cars all over the place. So, um, but in every other context, in every other place that isn't where flying cars would be, everything looks... Well, um, normal, like they do today. And ironically, yeah. that's what's happened. Not much has changed other than, you know, like, people having iPhones and stuff. Yeah. 
it looks kind of pedestrian, except for that one building he's in that's all white, you know, the, the hospital. Yeah, and again, it's things like that, like, you know, I assume new hospitals must have been built, because I think the city is a lot closer to, um, like, the family house when it's revisited later. So I sh- assume population growth, they will have built a new hospital at some point. But it, I, Yeah. I mean, I do love these establishing shots. I just feel like they'd fit in better in a different movie. <laughs> yeah. I um, mean, they're beautiful, you know. They're, they're probably based on some great artwork, which I would love to see. And I would love to see the deleted scenes of this movie. I, I say, you know, release the Columbus cut. <laughs> release the Columbus cut. <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who doesn't want three hours of Bicentennial Man and awkward three minutes conversations about sex? Yeah, there's like three of them. <laughs> there are! Because there's the one where Sam Neill is doing the birds and the bees and talking to um, Andrew about sperm and, and Andrew feels sorry for Was that sperm. in 2005? How old was Andrew at the time? What? <laughs> he was telling a toddler about sperm. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> oh. Although, uh, if a question the film is asking if is what if Robin Williams was a robot, I fully believe that this would be a, a complete answer to that question. Yes, this is Rob- Robot Williams. Robot Williams. Shall we call him that for the rest of the movie? Rob E. Williams. <laughs> yeah, Robot Williams. Even though it's Robin Williams, not Robin Williams, we've already done that joke. Yes, yeah, I don't want to rock DJ. Sorry for how I sound in the preamble, by the way. We hadn't figured out how to do this properly yet. No, no, the sound quality's been fixed. Should be a lot smoother from now on, guys. Yep. So yeah, to sum up question two, because we're still on question two, how well do you think the film accomplished its goals? Well, we didn't really establish what those goals are. I think it's very simple. I think it's just to tell the story of a robot who is human. Well, it explored become... the nature of humanity and what it means to be human to a point. Yes. Because it's undoubtable. The movie is definitely pushing us to acknowledge him as a human. Yeah. There are definitely a lot of parallels you can draw to things like that. Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, Bicentennial Man was saying trans rights before, you know... A lot of movies were, frankly. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that, that the allegories, to me, are obvious. Maybe not so much to audiences at the time. I don't know. I don't was know. It, um... Was it intentional? I mean, you know, did Chris Columbus say trans rights? Yeah. Uh, well, I would hope so. I yeah, hope it doesn't too, come but... across as patronising in any no. way to liken trans people to Bicentennial Man. <laughs> no. But, um... <laughs> the transition and the fact that people don't really accept... Uh, for want of a better term, his identity is... Yeah. Uh... Because quite often there's several characters, you know, like the jerk lawyer um, who um, uh, was played by Bradley Whitford, who was the villain in Billy Madison, who I think is typecast as being a jerk. And... Yeah, he, he he always plays <laughs> just a massively arrogant... Well, very, unple- very unpleasant man. Yes, he's always an arsehole. But did somebody go up to him and say, you look like you're a right piece of work, how would you like to be in this movie? (laughs) Uh, Uh, You know, you're very good at presenting yourself as fundamentally (laughs) unlikable. Boy, have we got a job for you! (laughs) How would you like to play an evil lawyer? uh, Yeah, you've got the owner of the company that builds robots and you've got Bradley Whitford who are constantly calling him an it and also the other daughter who you know says the robot's here when he comes to visit dying Sam Neill so you know the prejudice is there's a lot of parallels there yeah yeah and it's not in our face it's just sort of presented as a sad sort of fact of life it is what it is yeah (laughs) for, for Robin Williams in this movie and the interesting thing is it does pose some really good philosophical questions, you know, particularly towards the end, because you sort of see where they're coming from when they mention the envy of a person towards, you know, an immortal being. And, you know, yeah. it, it, even the character, the um, judge character at the very end, who does grant him his humanity, um, does acknowledge that it's a complex and controversial 
uh, decision to make a ruling on. Yeah. Um, can I just mention that, uh, well, we touched on, on this while we were watching it. The judge that uh, denied him his humanity was a crusty old white guy. I actually well, used those words. Yeah, you did. Whereas the the chairperson several decades later is a black woman who grants him his humanity. And I'm not saying that that was definitely intended to signify progress or progressive ideals, but it could definitely be read that way. Yeah, I read it that way anyway. Uh, I think it was intentional. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I, mean, I like... Who the hell knows what Chris Columbus intended with that movie? I don't know. I think it would be interesting to find out. I, I'm actually going to read into this um, afterwards and see if he's ever really spoken on in length on the subject because the sad thing is I think if anybody interviewed Christopher Columbus it wouldn't be to ask him a load of questions about the making of Bicentennial Man and his thought process. No, I suppose it wouldn't. It would be more about the discovery of America. Well, yeah. Um, do I keep calling him Christopher Columbus? Yes, you do. Oh, is it? Well, that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I think we've established what the film's goals there about were, and I think it beautifully accomplished them. Although, yeah. with some clunkiness on the sides. It was definitely... Um, I'm not sure what the film would have needed to be better. I mean, you could say make it less funny, but you've got Robin Williams, how can you? You know, uh, he he just exudes a sort of charm and... I don't think making it less funny would have made the film better. No, like, I don't. I, mean, I think, if anything, it would have made the movie a bit less enjoyable. You could argue that the script with a bit of a rework could have uh, could have been better. Although, I, I didn't pick up anything glaringly bad about it, I hasten to add. It's yeah. just that... I don't know, maybe... I think maybe pick one particular period of time to focus on would have been mm. something to do. But then you couldn't really call it Bicentennial Man because you have to tell the whole story, really. Yeah. You have to tell the whole story. I mean, you could do it through flashbacks, I suppose, but yeah. I don't know. I like that we progress along with how the character progresses. What I was getting at was that giving him a consistent... Um, well, it's difficult because giving him more consistent supporting characters to uh, have a better rapport with as opposed to carrying it on to the next generation would have made a bit more sense, but also it would have run counter to the point yes. that time doesn't work the same way for him. Uh, you know, and he chooses, you know, essentially for it to work in a mortal way. But what I love about his choice and the timing of him making the decision to become mortal towards the end is at this point he suffered two losses, like two significant losses in his life. He understands... Uh, both what it means to be immortal, because it's going to keep happening to the people he loves, but also he understands the sort of pain of being human, and he still embraces it despite knowing the negatives and being warned by several characters that it's not all good, that all these emotions and all these physical sensations aren't always going to be pleasant. Yeah, and could be difficult to tolerate uh, words that are actually used. Yes, um, by the Burns character, who I, I actually really like in this movie. Yeah. Do you have any more to say on this subject? You know, how well the film accomplished its goals? Uh, no, I suppose I don't. Uh... Well, I suppose that brings us to the third question. Did the movie exceed your expectations? Uh, well, I'd seen it before, so I knew what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, this question is sort of open-ended. It's for movies we have seen, movies we haven't seen. Because, you know, you can still go into a movie with expectations if you haven't seen it for a while, uh, or if you haven't seen it with particularly fresh eyes, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I was saying earlier, I would have liked to have seen more of the world. I really like the look, the aesthetic of the artificial organs like, yes. Apropos of nothing, I, I that holds up well. It's a really interesting sort of take on, well, artificial organs, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, what's the word? Um, biomechanical technology. Yeah. it's a really good. It's a really interesting take on bio on a biomechanical aesthetic, and yeah. um, 
yeah, I, I really liked that. Those are organs I could see having in my body. Would Were they actually real? <laughs> and one thing I think is understated, because I think it just wanted to show the character for who they were, yeah. is how much this character's unintentionally helped people along the way. Well, I don't say unintentionally, I mean... You know, as incidentally. A consequence, yeah, incidentally help people, because interestingly, the crusty old white guy who uh, denies him the uh, ability of being human himself wouldn't be alive if it weren't for the organs that Andrew invented. Yeah. Which uh, is quite that, ironic. Yeah, that is, that is true. Um... Uh, <laughs> But, oh, I love how much detail went into that one plot point, though. That he, they came up with a way for him to um, come up with the idea to transition into a human. Uh, they they came up with a load of really impressive steps for him to do that. Yes, I mean, like, like he downloaded all of the uh, medical texts in the world into his brain. Uh, you know, it sort of goes to show that sometimes you do have to um, cheat a little bit for progress. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because it is his like... innate robotics, you know, that he was built with that allowed him to transition into a human. Yeah, a lot of uh, thought went into that setup, I, I think. But I think the most beautiful message of the movie, in a way, and something we haven't even touched on yet... It's a small thing, a very small thing, and I think you missed out on it until this time, is the Galatea character, who's this other robot who, you know, is deliberately very perky, you know, has sort of been programmed to, um, you know, be quite subservient and wish fulfilment for the um, Burns character, uh, yeah. who is another robot of his type, a female robot. Uh, I don't know what um, utility role the... I think oh, well, it's it, more a cosmetic difference. Yeah, but. it's a cosmetic difference. I mean, it's sci-fi. We can give it a pass. But you, one thing I've noticed is that at the end of every scene involving those two characters, the last thing we see is her looking at him. And then at the very end of the movie, we see a nurse character who we'd not seen before um, in the waiting room with um, Andrew and uh, the love interest character I can't remember the name of. Um, but yeah... Uh, and then it's revealed through conversation that that is Galatea. And she says quite emotionally, as the um, great Andrew once said, one is glad to be of service. So we sort of take from this that she's taken inspiration from this. You know, that she's had time to reflect and come to similar conclusions about herself. And, you know, that we don't know to what extent, but she herself is planning or has uh, made a transition at this point. Well, it is established pretty quickly that Andrew is unique. And yes. well, he finds every robot in his series, yeah. if you will. And Galatea is the only one who whose personality intrigues him enough for him to follow her. But then it turns out it was just as programmed as all of the others, just by someone who's better at it, I guess. But another feature of humanity is we all develop at different paces. And yeah. we all come to conclusions at different paces. I mean, for example, I'm sure that a lot of people have come to certain conclusions about their own identity a lot later than others. You know, and that's okay. We all develop at different paces and, you know, we're all different. Everyone is valid in their own way. And that's one of the messages of the movie, even if it is a little understated. Well, very understated, because it's not really that obvious. Yeah, and that's just lovely. It is. It's a very heartwarming movie. And, you know, I hope that people listening to this who maybe have only seen it once or twice and maybe possibly even dismissed it, go back, watch it and find these new things to appreciate about it. Okay, so what is the next question? It's underappreciated. It is definitely underappreciated. Yes. What's the next question? I feel like we've been on this one for a while. We have. I'm sorry, I'll get off my Bicentennial Man soapbox. Uh, is there an element in this film that specifically appeals to you? Well, I think we've already covered that <laughs> in... All of the ones we've mentioned already! <laughs> yeah, all of the ones we've mentioned already. I, uh... As I say, I particularly like the futurist aesthetic when it is there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, you know, the organs. Like, they look... Now, I know nothing about this field at all, but they look realistic to me. Yeah, they look like something that we're maybe a few years from developing ourselves in 
the real life timeline, which is quite yeah. interesting because you know that is something that humanity has made progress on in the last few years. You know, it's now possible to have heart transplants, you know, um, head transplants. All of this uh, wouldn't have been possible even a few years ago. Yeah. Another thing when you mention the sci-fi aesthetic that I quite like is the design of the robots. Because especially the ones that are sort of found in ruin, which look a bit clunkier and, you know, obviously more worn and less refined, remind me a lot of the sort of concept art of C-3PO. If you've ever seen oh, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it's mainly the torso. I mean, I don't know. I'll try and do a side by side. I could, could be completely off the mark. I could be misremembering horribly, but that's something I picked up. It seems to be a truth almost universally acknowledged in sci fi that people don't want robots to look too human because it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah, like we were saying, there's a bit of an uncanny valley um, sort of aspect to this. Yeah. Especially in the beginning, because there's a few scenes played for laughs where they sort of say, Andrew, can you stand over there in the kitchen? And he does so, and then he's just sort of standing there awkward watching them, and they (laughs) they just feel awkward, the family. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if if robots like this, you know, like sort of basically protocol droids were made, then, you know, I don't think they would look that lifelike. I don't think people would feel comfortable with that. No. I don't think they'd even look as lifelike as Andrew originally did. No, and he sort of had the facial elements of Robin Williams. You know, obvious why that is, you know, but yeah. you could sort of tell even then it was, you know, without hearing him speak, it was Robin Williams. It was a suit, wasn't it? We never checked. No, no, no. he um, literally um, made himself into a robot for the film. No, I mean, like, how much of it was CGI, if any? I don't think any of it was. I think some of it may have been prosthetics, because there was definitely a Tin Man element to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's not being derogatory. I think it was quite good for its time. No, no, it does look uh, very good for what it is. I mean, the establishing shots do look a bit cheap, and I think they make the right decision to have a lot of them at dusk and at night. But yeah. also, <laughs> they're not that worse than what you see a bit later on in The Phantom Menace. You know, and I definitely got Phantom Menace vibes like you did with the same building. Which came out the same year. Yes, yeah, I, I think it looked impressive enough. It, it, you know, it wasn't an action story. You know, it it doesn't need to look like um, Blade Runner, does it? No, I suppose not. <laughs> uh, but one thing I really appreciate about this movie, an element of this film that specifically appealed to me, was the mentor character, um, Sam Neill, who I think it's crazy that he's not in more film and TV. I don't know what... Maybe he's just retired, you know... Um, I imagine he's made a lot of money from the Jurassic Park movies. He's probably had a good innings. Maybe he doesn't want to act or be in the public eye. But I think that's a shame because he's amazing. I mean, I loved him in this movie. I think it's his best role. Um, Let me try and think what else he's been in. He was in The Omen 3. That's uh, right. I think uh, The Iron Giant, wasn't he? Was he? Who did he play in The Iron Giant? I'm sure he's in The Iron Giant for some reason, but I'm not sure. He also had his own documentary series. It was called Space, and it was about space. Like one episode, he'd be talking about black holes. He'd be standing in front of this CGI structure. I don't know how else to describe it, but that was a good series. And a little bit of a random thing for a Hollywood actor to be doing uh, just this British documentary series. But I think it's the only time I've seen him as a mentor character, and he lends himself really well to that. You know, because yeah. he, he comes across as quite well-learned, like the perfect kind of person. You know, he's obviously quite affluent. It's never established what he does for a living, but, you know, clear enough to buy a robot, because <laughs> he does go off for work. But he takes an immediate interest in Andrew, which I like, because the rest of the family are kind of ambivalent to having a robot around. You know, at first, anyway. Um, yeah, and he's yeah. really excited about it. He's like, this is great, we've got a robot now. You know, and I think that's probably how most dads would feel about having a robot, to be fair. So that's quite relatable. <laughs> yeah. But he picks up on things quite quickly, and he encourages um, Andrew to grow and thrive. You know, he encourages him to learn, he teaches him skills, he gives him some independence, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but yep. you know, he sort of makes it inevitable that he is going to grow into the person he ends up being. 
Yeah, and they they say as much in the film. Yeah, but I like that he's a flawed and a, a flawed um, uh, mentor as well. You know, which we don't see that often uh, because you know he himself isn't free of his own prejudices. Uh, he doesn't completely acknowledge Andrew as anything other than a machine, even though he knows deep down that he's different. Uh, you know, he treats him as a machine at several points. And one moment that you questioned, actually, is when he is initially very salty and upset about Andrew's decision to become free and buy his freedom and buy himself out of servitude. Yeah. It's like, why does he actually have a problem with that? I mean, I think it's explained very well by the previous scene, though, because the last scene we see is just after Little Miss's wedding, when he's having a heart-to-heart with Andrew at the pool. You know, which I liked, because it was the first time we got to see him present as a human, you know, wearing clothes. Uh, the, the robot, not Sam Neill. You know, Sam Neill is fully clothed throughout this movie. Don't worry. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Sam Neill, you know, does open up about how he's sad because both of his daughters have moved away and he feels alone now. So you can sort of understand why he reacts so strongly to Andrew wanting his freedom. Oh, uh, Sam Neill wasn't in the Iron Giant. I don't know why I thought oh. he was. <laughs> he he seems like the type who would be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if that's not an odd thing to say. <laughs> uh. But, I mean, he does sort of recant on his deathbed, and he does get the chance to apologise, and I feel like the movie would have missed something if, it, if he didn't. Because he comes yeah. back towards the end with his, you know, people develop through time, but time is a completely different prospect to you, you know, monologue. Yeah. It's, as, well, is that a flashback, or is he playing it back in his head? Do you well, know I what? Suppose... It doesn't matter. Let's not nitpick. It's... Yeah, we know I suppose it doesn't saying. matter to him, does it? No. You know, it's like the same people who are saying, like, but why is Han Solo on the, you know, there with Ben? He's dead. He's not physically there. Stop taking everything at base value. Okay, well, that's another uh, that's another topic for another yeah, video. Yeah, I- I'm not going to open up the Star Wars box today. Yes, please don't. We've mentioned The Phantom Menace enough times. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But that's one element that specifically appealed to me. The flawed mentor, we don't see it enough in fiction. Everyone expects the teacher to be perfect themselves. And they shouldn't be, because they're only human. And that's the point of this movie, being human. Yeah, yeah. I liked Little Miss, that character in this. Yeah, yeah, she was... I really um, felt it um, when she passed away. Uh, That was a hard scene to sit through, to be honest. It it was. um, Again, I wish we got more time with her, but then that would run counter to the point. The film... She sort of teaches him how to love and empathise, doesn't she? The film is sort of at odds with its premise, if that makes sense. Elaborate. Well, the fact that we have to see this whole story about a robot... You make it sound like a chore. No, I mean... the. F- <laughs> I mean, the fact that this whole story has to be told in a little over two hours basically yeah. necessitates that a lot of what would be... Um, well, good character development scenes would get cut. I mean, Little Miss goes straight from being, what, five years old to being 17 or something. No, she's it... older than that, like 30s, I think. Oh, no, there was a time skip in between. I think you might be right. No, I was talking about the one at the piano. The really good yeah. transition. I love that but, scene. Yeah, it is a really good transition, but you don't see this little girl grow up. And. No. I I get that that could be symbolic of the fact that to Andrew it's no time at all. No. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I see where you're coming from. Because he's changed a lot off screen, and I think that's okay. Yeah. Because we're looking at, um, what's the word, uh, fundamental points in his life where he's determined to make a change or... Because he doesn't start off saying, you know, I'm going to be a human, I'm really human. He realises it over time as he develops. Yeah, he, um, it takes him a while to come to that conclusion. But what I was saying is, I think the fact that that is the story that we're telling is kind of at odds with, um, the medium of film 
needing to uh, be a certain level of concise and also the fact that there are so many other characters that aren't him well again we don't get enough time with the other characters to really get to know them and well he does but we're just kind of expected to assume we're just kind of expected to assume an emotional level of investment yeah, and the movie does well at filling in the blanks. Maybe could do a little bit more at times. Yeah, I think it's fair to say this story is better told as a book. And I've, it's based on two books. It's based on Bicentennial Man, which was a short story written by Isaac Asimov, and The Positronic Man, which was a much longer book written again by Isaac Asimov with somebody else who, again, I feel embarrassed not to know the name of this other person. But right. Well, I didn't know that. I'm going to have to read them and compare. I would like to read both of those, actually, because I love this story. In fact, I think, if anything, it's a far better story than it is a movie, even though it is a good movie. Yeah. It's a compelling story, and I I wish we could have seen a lot more of it. But, you know, within the constraints of the medium of film, I don't think that would have been possible to much more of a greater extent. While we're on the subject of uh, specific aspects of the film that appealed, yeah. um, Robin Williams. Yes. It's like, what else needs to be said? This film's about as Robin Williams as it gets. Oh, he's perfect for this role. Yeah. <laughs> uh. he, he does his stand-up. He does his emotional stuff. He, yeah. He, he, you felt like he was invested in this movie. It's Robin Williams' acting reel, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he wasn't just doing this for a quick paycheck. You can tell that he really cared about this movie <laughs> and what it was trying to do. Uh, you could really feel it during the emotional scenes, like when he's on Little Miss's deathbed, when he um, sees Sam Neill for the last time. You just feel these scenes and his speech. Uh, the score the... has a lot to do with that as well. It, it's a good score. Oh, yeah. I mean... Even without the music, I think it would have some power, but it's a very tearjerker soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who did the soundtrack? Uh, I'm going to look it up, because it's a great disservice not to give a shout-out to whoever it is. Yeah. Yeah, the soundtrack was made by James Horner. James Horner. That's apparently, not a name I know. <laughs> although, he, apparently he has produced the soundtracks to 100 movies. Oh. Huh. Some of the Star Trek movies... Oh, he did Wrath of Khan. He did Search for Spock. He did Cocoon. Um, Batra is not included. Field of I Dreams. I vaguely remember Cocoon. Uh, Field of Dreams. You know, um, that, uh, again, is another very sentimental movie. So I think he lends himself... He was in American Tale as well, The Land Before Time. It's very sentimental movies, both of them. Yeah. Make you feel things. He is perfect for this kind of movie. Mask of Zorro. Mask of Zorro. I've not seen it. It's on my list. Yeah. Uh, oh my... What? Apparently he did the score to Avatar, the um, uh, James Cameron film. Oh, really? How do we not know this? I don't know. Well, that's not my favourite Avatar, to be honest. What, you prefer the M. Night Shyamalan one? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, we've still got two questions to get through, but they're considerably easier to answer, I think. Yeah. Number five. How does the film stack up today? I think it's as good today as it was in 1999. I'll go one step further, Ollie. I think this movie is going to get more relevant with time, because as artificial intelligence develops through time. You're going to see more of the moral and philosophical dilemmas come up. Some of these things might even come up for real. You know, who knows? We can only fathom what we as a species are capable of developing in the future when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, When it comes to the social problems, you know, that, well, were prevalent at the time, but also today, again, there's real world allegories, you know, so hopefully somebody out there will be able to watch this movie and get something from it. I don't know if I share your optimism, because to quote a great author, real stupidity will be artificial intelligence every time. But do you know what? There's real stupidity in this movie. You know, you see the idiot characters and the ignorant characters, 
that's always going to be something we unfortunately have to tolerate. It was Terry Pratchett I was quoting, by the way. Yeah, Terry Pratchett. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, what was it? I, I see your point. I do think um, as technology develops, it will become more relevant. How does it stack up to date? Well, you're really asking um, the same question of pretty much every aspect there. So um, I would say that the minimalist decision with the futuristic stuff was probably a good one because yeah. ev- everything looks quite normal for the most part and that doesn't age out. <laughs> because as somebody who's lived through 2005 and it's now you know over half my life away in the past... <laughs> you know, a lot of this, the the aspects of this movie haven't aged well. You know, but they're superficial things. You know, it's nothing fundamental. You know, it, it's not a movie that looks futuristic. It's not a movie where the time it's set in is that important, really. No, it's ironic no. considering the premise of the movie. Yeah, so I think visually it has managed to. Age as gracefully as uh, films do. Let's face it, not many movies visually can age well. Yeah, I mean, there are some timeless classics. Oh, yeah. Most of them animated in terms of a visual Yeah, well, it's so much easier to do in that medium. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think traditional animation but, will never fade away completely. You know, I think, I think Tron has aged very well vis- visually. I saw some clips from that the other week. It still looks good to this day. And, you know, I watched Tron Legacy about a year ago and that didn't look that much different to Tron. You know, which is remarkable considering that one was made in the present day and one was made back in the 80s. Or was it the early 90s? I don't know. When was Tron made? If you know, leave us a comment. But my take on the movie and how it stacks up today, it's a fine wine. It's a penny stock. It's going to appreciate over time. Uh, dig it out for your children or descendants. I think they'll appreciate this. Yeah, I um, I definitely think this is good family viewing. Yeah, yeah, it's good family viewing. Uh, it teaches kids the right sort of um, morals, but also encourages them to think about, you know, philosophical and moral dilemmas. I probably sound really pretentious, but you get what I'm trying to say, don't you? It's a really good introduction to a lot of mature concepts. Yes. That is very accessible to a younger audience, I think. So I think this is a really good kids film, even though he does say shit a couple of times. <laughs> oh. oh dear. Damn, I, I, like I how swore. I, you, Sorry, you, you, you blasphemed, Ollie, you blasphemed. Yeah, I, I was going to say, oh shit, I swore. <laughs> Well done, Ollie. <laughs> well done. We saved look, the city. Uh, I, look, I I have a dirty mouth. You know this. You do. You do. Uh, but yeah, it made me think when I was ten. Uh, show it to the ten-year-olds of the future. It'll make them think too. Yeah. Ready for the last question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Lay it on me. Oh, this is a good one for this movie. Was the film received appropriately at the time? Well, if the critics' consensus on Rotten Tomatoes is to be believed, I don't think so. But was Rotten Tomatoes even a thing in 1999? When are these reviews I think from? it aggregates reviews from uh, where, whenever it can get them. It, it's not necessarily reviews since the website was started. It, I think it's an it's an aggregate website. It finds reviews from all over and then corroborates them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's not a very mainstream-feeling movie, so I'm not sure how much of an audience it had in 1999. So I think the better question is, was the film received at all at the time? I don't know. Okay, do you know how much um, Bicentennial Man's budget was, Ollie? How much? A hundred million dollars. That is impressive. And the box office was 87.4 million. So it lost money. And I think that's sad. I think that's really sad. I mean, maybe if they didn't spend so much money on flying cars, they could have, uh, you know, made some money there. But 
it deserved to do so much better. It, it kills me that this movie lost money. Yeah. Well, uh, then, no, I don't think it was appropriately received at the time. I think it deserved to do better. I don't quite know where that $100 million went, if I'm being honest. No, I mean, you know, there's like four high-budget establishing shots, and then there's a lot of prosthetics, and that's about it. I mean, I don't know where the money went. I suppose Robin Williams and Sam Neill, hot off the heels of Jurassic Park, you know, will have come with a hefty price tag for themselves. Because, you know, uh, Robin Williams was huge at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was, you know, after, uh, you know, um, Mrs. Doubtfire. So, you know, he would have been a household name at this point. Do you know when this movie was released? When? December 17th, 1999. So right bang in the middle of our mandated time period. Yeah. But also it was a Christmas movie and it was a Millennium movie. Is this the movie? I mean, I guess in a way it's fitting that it released just as the, the turn of the century, well, the millennium happened, because, you know, it's a movie looking to the future. But is this a Christmas movie? Is this a movie that you and the kids will want to go and see at Christmas time? Well, um, the period doesn't seem relevant. It's not a seasonal movie at all. Uh, exactly, it's not a seasonal movie, so you can stick it on any time, and I think that's much better. <laughs> should it have? Should the release have been postponed? Perhaps, you know, did it suffer from being a December movie? Maybe uh, it definitely would have suffered from being a January movie. So perhaps it did. Uh, yeah, which is sad, really. Because... Well, we can only speculate, but, uh, but the if point you look is, at... sorry, the point is, I think it deserved to do better than it did. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how it was marketed, but just judging by the trailer, it's like they promised Mrs. Doubtfire and gave us goodwill hunting, so it's yeah. probably not a movie that people would have gone to see over and over again. They gave us Mrs. It. Doubtfire and goodwill hunting, except for when they didn't, and I think that was the problem. Yeah, here. it's basically Mrs. Doubtfire if everybody died at the end. <laughs> wow, that's grim. <laughs> it's Quentin Tarantino's um, Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> and on that happy note, conclusions... Conclusions. I love it. If you haven't seen it, I don't know why you've been listening to us talk about this movie for over an hour, because that must have spoiled a lot of things for you. But if you haven't seen it in ages, go back and watch it. It's a it's a sleeper movie. This is so much better than critics are saying, and hardly anybody knows about it today. I, I try and strike up conversations on the street, you know, because I'm like Forrest Gump. Uh, and, you know, I say, guys, have you seen... Bicentennial Man, and nobody to this day has said yes to me. Hopefully one day I'll meet another soul who's seen Bicentennial Man other than Ollie. Yeah. Um, well, I very much enjoy this movie. Perhaps more than it is... Uh, perhaps more than it is good from a technical or even narrative standpoint. But <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you. I really like it. It's... Cheesy as all hell, but in a way that I don't find uh, particularly egregious. I I like this level of cheese. It's, um, I mean, you've got sex talk. You've got, um, you know, uh, tiny mammals. I love that line. Yeah, <laughs> with <laughs> little Mrs. Love of tiny mammals. I just love his delivery there. It feels so robot, but it feels so Robin Williams. Yeah, I I do really like this film. It's. I can see why people might be turned off. Uh, might be too saccharine for some. Yeah. It might not flow well for others. It definitely um, might feel a little long. I mean, uh, it's but... heavy. If um, you feel... Uh, well, if you're particularly vulnerable to emotional movies or you have a particular yeah. love for Robin Williams, you know, it might you might have to be in the right frame of mind to watch this and, you know, come out of this feeling the better, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, though, I, I do think everyone should watch this film at least once. I think it is one of those. Yes. Like, you're either going to like it or you're not, but I think you're, um... I don't think you're going to come away poorer for having seen it, unless you spent a lot of money to see it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. It's on TV quite regularly. You can probably find it in car boots if they still have that these days. Yeah. 
It's not on any streaming service that I'm aware of, apart from Prime Video, if you buy it. Which is extremely sad. Although, interestingly, it used to be on Netflix, but it used to have a really terrible thumbnail. It's just hard not to like this movie. I feel like we've only scraped the surface. There's so much to appreciate. Also, there's an interesting cameo. You've um, got um, uh, of Harvey Birdman fame, Michael Higgins, John Michael Higgins. Yes, he played Mentok, the Mind Taker. (laughs) He plays a lawyer character. (laughs) I'm not sure why, but he's there and he's got his cameo. You know. I need you to now edit clips of Mentok the Mind Taker into that that character. It's going in, Ollie. It's going in. <laughs> was this the zenith of Batman's career? Possibly. Or was it Harvey oh. Birdman? You know, leave your... <laughs> it's open to interpretation. Leave your comments in the comments section where they belong. <laughs> leave your stupid comments in your pocket. <laughs> no, don't, don't. Please tell no, us your stupid to... and non-stupid comments. Yeah, we don't care how inane your views are. They can't be more inane than ours. <laughs> this is true. Okay. Ah, uh, oh, this uh, was fun. Yeah, well, I had a good time doing this. Yeah. Next week we've got a special treat for you. Uh, watch out for an announcement of what next week's review is. In the meantime, take care, everybody. I uh, hope you've taken something from this hour of rambles. Yep, and uh, we'll see you next week for more monkey business. Looking forward to it. See ya.